Gentleman from Iowa, Mr. Feenstra. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and I just want to say thank you uh, to each of our, our witnesses today. In absence of the consultation by the Treasury, we've relied on your analysis uh, by those like you to understand uh, this agreement that's uh, being put before us. And just a quick, simple uh, 101 economics tax lesson. Uh, individuals and families pay tax, but they don't make goods and services. So they can't pass down uh, the cost of tax, right? They just have to pay it. In corporations, and I'm talking to my colleagues on the other side of the aisle, on corporations, when you increase their tax, what happens? They pass it down through their goods and services. So goods and services increase, causing inflation, uh, causing the issues that we're currently in. That's actually called Economics 101. Um, I, I just want you to know, these processes and agreements that, that or what we are seeing is when you pursue a partisan domestic tax agenda in an international tax forum. It really is. Ms. Hurstfield, you pointed out in your article that the two largest benefactor in terms of revenue were Canada and Germany, and yet we saw that Canada declined to, decline to sign the recent Pillar 1 agreement, and Germany is now taxing IP under Section 49 of its tax code in what appears to be purely a revenue grab from U.S. firms. So despite being the largest benefactor of Pillar 2, they're moving forward with discriminatory taxes against American uh, uh, businesses. At the same time, these new rules may violate U.S. tax treaties, so my understanding was that these agreements were intended to stabilize the international tax code. But in essence, am I fair to say that they're de they could and seems to be could realize that they are destabilizing our code? Could that actually happen? Uh, yes, th thank you for the question. So, so I think there is a question about whether the promises about stability that this international agreement uh, is supposed to bring what will actually come to fruition in addition to the examples you provided. There's also the example of Australia that has proposed a, a tax that's outside uh, the, the scope of what was agreed to. And so, so all of those examples show that, uh, raise questions about the promises of stability that the agreement was supposed to bring. Thank you. Michael, you noted that also. Can you just note, just 20 seconds on that? It, the beginning of this project uh, process started when France and other European unions started with digital services taxes. So I think the entire project starts with the assumption that you can agitate at the international level by putting these unilateral measures on other countries. Yep. And so that in and of itself tells you that this system is unstable Thank and you. we're going to continue to see these types of unilateral actions as people agitate. Exactly. For Thanks for that. Changes. Thanks for stating that because every country is different. Uh, we're going to destabilize the international tax system by going down this path. Ms. Gordon, it's good to see you again. I, I'm glad you're here. The NFTC's members include U.S. businesses that have been impacted by this agreement, many of whom provided comments throughout this negotiating process. And some of these comments, a large part of the comments, were a lot about proprietary information that they will have to give up. You know, it sounds like there could be over 200 data points that they've got to do compared to guilty where you have around 16, 14 to 16, somewhere in there. I mean, this seems very egregious and makes it very uncompetitive to us when we have to give up all our proprietary information to the international code. Can you comment on that? Uh, Congressman, thank you for your question and great seeing you as well. Yes, so um, the numbers of 50,000 to 200,000 come from multiplying uh, the number 200 or versus 16 um, by all the entities, and yes. So taking all of that data and giving it to countries around the world who do not have the same protections for taxpayer information like the United States um, is a threat to American businesses. And many of these countries will either share it with state-run enterprises or local competitors um, and get tax advantages um, or details and knowledge of how these U.S. companies operate around the world, yep. um, which is not helpful. Yep, thank you. I agree 100%. Well, quickly, Mr. Scheiser, I, I read your uh, journal piece. I loved it, by the way. And you noted just what I said about Economics 101 is when you increase corporate tax, on, it affects the workers, it affects jobs, opportunities, economic growth. So can you explain why that is? I mean, just a basic economics 101 uh, that you wrote in your journal piece? My apologies. Thank you for the question. I, I do think there is a, a misunderstanding in the general public about who pays the corporate tax. 
could be that investors pay some of it, but it is very clear that consumers pay some and that workers pay a lot. And so when we talk about who should pay it, we have to remember that. Thank you. You just made my point. I yield back. Thank the